You're listening to Hockey to Heroin, the road to recovery on the Hockey Podcast Network. New episodes Wednesdays and Saturdays. Follow Hockey to Heroin on Twitter. That's at Hockey, the number two heroin for updates and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. Brady Leavitt, like any other Canadian kid, his dream was to play in the National Hockey League. Success came easily to Leopold as he began to turn heads in the junior leagues. Only pass for Long, he's got Leopold with him. Long walks in, Sanders, goal! Leopold's a right-hand shot, rotates, and then sends it along back to Leopold. And a boy, Brady! And here we go, right off the bat, a fight ensues. And it's Leavold and Kerr, and they're both getting in shots. Now Leavold throwing right after right and just connecting like crazy. Once I met heroin, I mean, it was just, that became my new passion. What's the reason that young people who are athletes get addicted to heroin? They injure themselves, and they're more likely to be prescribed an opioid. And once addicted, many are going to switch over to heroin because it's much more cost-effective. And the effects that they produce in the brain are indistinguishable. When we talk about painkillers, we're essentially talking about heroin pills. Welcome back to another edition of Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery. This is Brady Liebold coming at you guys again from Utterson, Ontario, wedged right in the heart of beautiful Muskoka, Ontario, Canada. Like I said, guys, I'm very lucky to live up here. Uh, Had an interview scheduled yesterday, but unfortunately the rain was pounding down. Uh, Where I'm at with the studio, uh, once again, of course, I'm in the Matthew Lashinsky studio, Memorial studio. Uh, I'll say it every podcast, Matthew Lashinsky, born in 1987. Uh, This guy was drafted second round in the OHL priority selection draft by the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds. He played a couple seasons with them. He battled with mental health and addiction, much like myself. Uh, unfortunately, Matthew Lashinsky lost his battle with addiction in 2017. I never knew him, um, but through this podcast, I've been able to meet uh, so many great people. I've heard so many great stories and so many uh, tragic stories, and this is one of them. Uh, but I was able to meet Matt Thompson, uh, a, a really good friend of Matthew Lashinsky's, and he shared the story about his friend that passed away. Uh, and I just heard so much of my own story in that and uh, me and Matt have talked every day since we've become really good friends Uh, and over the course of the first few weeks we were talking him and I decided uh, that we were going to recreate this studio uh, in Matthew Lashinsky's honor Uh, so I had if you've been listening and following along uh, I give you guys updates Uh, uh, it's on it's been on hold for two weeks Matthew Thompson is coming up tomorrow i've never even met this guy in person he's driving down from ottawa tomorrow he's going to spend a couple of days with me Uh, i got the wood lumber ordered we're going to frame up a a studio three times the size of the one i'm sitting in now uh we've had a few donations from people from matthew lashinsky's family his mom his sister his dad are going to come up i've had a plaque made for this oh man i'm just so excited matthew thompson's excited uh so that's what i'm doing uh tomorrow and monday tuesday really excited guys uh if anybody wants to help us uh, we've had a few great donations i appreciate it uh but like i said before we are extremely proud honored uh to build this in his name uh and once again i'll say too i just found out the other day uh that about two weeks after lashinsky passed away a good friend of mine that i played in the tampa bay lightning organization also passed away from a similar situation uh mitch fadden lost his battle as well and this guy lived with him in the hotel for three months in the american hockey league and uh guys it is just so prevalent there are so many hockey players struggling i mean there's so many people out there struggling guys but there are so many hockey players i haven't heard too many female but I am open. So we are open to this with the Puck Support Foundation, the foundation we have created uh, myself, Jesse Paradise, owner of TeamIssue.ca, the clothing brand, uh, Theron Fleury's on board, Chris Beach, former first rounder, NHL alumni, he's on board. I spoke to him last night, my dad, my best friend, Michael Hangan, Matt Thompson's on board. Uh, I've talked to Aaron Miller, the fe- a female who's uh, created a foundation. I'm going to speak to her tomorrow so she can iron out some of these kinks because we're incorporating this thing. I've emailed Ken Dryden. Uh, Ken Campbell from the Hockey News has helped me contact Ken Dryden. I have not heard back from him yet, but guys, listen, I have so much hope for this. Uh, it is such a good cause. I know I needed a team of uh, 
really hockey players to pull me out of where I was and it wasn't available to me and since I've been able to pull this pull myself out of this really on my own and been able to connect with other hockey players I've we've we've really noticed how prevalent uh, it is that guys are struggling with mental health addiction post concussion syndrome maybe they can't find a job um, there's so many uh, aspects to this things guys so if you want to support that great cause right now we don't have a web page uh, for that other than uh, you go to hockey to heroin dot com uh, on the main page there's a link I have a sub page on my page for the puck support foundation we should have our own page up in the next couple of weeks if anybody wants to join that great cause be a part of it fill out the contact form on my website uh, we're gonna hold a zoom meeting it should have taken place already in my mind uh, but uh, you know starting this thing I had no idea what it was what it was gonna entail uh, but I'm really happy to put in the work to do things the right way to meet all these great people and put together just an amazing team guys uh, to help both men women hockey players but uh, I really see this thing doing just outside of hockey as well athletes maybe even greater so but right now we're just gonna primarily focus on hockey let's run before we or let's walk before we run here uh, the last thing I really want to say guys uh, a couple upcoming guests Ryan Vandenbush Doug Gilmore uh, <laughs> Darren McCarty, four-time Stanley Cup champ. Really excited to talk to these guys. Uh, I have a huge guest on the show today, guys. It's the first female. Uh, really excited to talk to her. But of course, this episode number 21 is proudly brought to you by Team Issued Limited. Team Issued is connecting all walks of life. Team Issued does this by recreating that special part of being feeling a, a part of being something bigger. I screw that up every time, Jess. I don't know why. Uh, a community for all striving towards the same goal. Uh, guys, teamissued.ca. Use promo code TOEDRAG15 to get 15% off. If you have me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, I posted a, a video of my first WHL goal with a nasty toe drag, uh, buried it bar down. Uh, that is why the promo code is TOEDRAG15 because it is really the only move I know. Um, anyways, guys, uh, Two more things before we get into it. I got some good news yesterday. I'm going to be doing my first speaking event, which is great. And this is just leads into our, uh, our, our interview for today, guys, because this lady does this sort of stuff and I can't wait to pick her brain. Uh, but I'm going to be talking to the Georgian College up here in Ontario and Barrie. I'm really excited. I think it's going to be done by video just because of the COVID-19. Uh, but we're going to be working on that this week. There's the president of the, the uh, student council contacted me yesterday and wants to put it together. So uh, I'm really excited about that uh, because that's really what I want to be doing is I want to get out there, share my story uh, and help people. Right. So uh, other than that, June 1st, uh, thehockeynews.com uh, there's an article you guys can uh, purchase the itch issue uh, Ken Campbell one of the greatest hockey writers of all time uh, did an excellent article on my story on the podcast on the studio um, just on me going to jail getting my life together all that stuff guys and it is excellent so that's the third article that's been written since I started the podcast uh, and he did it based around my favorite song it's been a while by Stained um, and it's just such a great piece so guys check that out it'll probably be available on on their website for free in a couple of months uh, but let's support the hockey news uh, let's buy that issue guys and thank you to Ken Campbell um, other than that let's get right into the episode guys this is episode 21 my first female guest I mean this lady needs no introduction she's a lot older than me I don't like to age her uh, but man what a resume she was the first female coach in the National Hockey League. And we're not talking like a couple years ago, 10 years ago, we're talking 1977. Before I was even born, 10 years before I was born, uh, before I get into it, I mean, I wasn't around in 1977, but I mean, there's been a lot of change since 1977. And the fact that this lady was able to break into the National Hockey League as a coach, uh, is incredible but it's not really that incredible when you look at her resume and I watched her skating and she's a better skater than most of the guys in the NHL so really it was a no-brainer but at the same time in that time period uh, this lady was a real pioneer uh, she's a figure skater a speed skater she talks to high schools about drug and alcohol she's an animal activist she works for the fire department out in Long Island New York 
Barbara Williams. She worked with the New York Islanders for their Stanley Cup run, their dynasties in the 80s. Then she moved on to work with the New Jersey Devils. She's worked with over 200 NHL players privately for farm clubs. And I know she's uh, working out there every day on the ice, every single day. I even found a video of this lady on the game to tell the truth. Uh, unbelievable, Barbara Williams, without further ado, thank you so much for joining the program today. Hi, Brady. Barbara, it's so nice to finally connect with you. We had trouble uh, getting together yesterday. Uh, the rain was pounding down in the studio, and uh, just where where it's at right now, it just is no soundproof. So I want to say thank you, Barbara, um, for your patience. We couldn't make it happen yesterday. I know yesterday was a, a difficult day for you, and I'll leave that up to you if you want to talk about it or not. But I just before we start, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're really busy. Uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, you have a lot going on but let's start uh back from day one uh because you know as i said you're a female and you're really the pioneer uh i can't i can't even imagine how many uh little girls that are now women uh even little girls that will be women how how you've inspired them and given them uh you know the drive or the belief that they can they can too accomplish things that maybe they once thought they couldn't uh, because Barbara you're not a hockey player are you? No I played hockey one time and the whole team was after me even my own teammates <laughs> and I left that rink black and blue and I said I will never do this again <laughs> I mean I just wanted to play the game and see how it felt I didn't think my own teammates would be checking me into the boards <laughs> But I did that, um, that was a long time ago. But in 1977, I was director of the figure skating school, Racket and Rink in Farmingdale, Long Island, and that's where the Islanders practice. And every morning I would go in early, you know, to do paperwork. And one morning I went in and I was watching Bobby Nystrom and he was on the ice doing edges and balance work. And I went up to him, I said, Bobby, what are you doing? And he said, I'm working on my skating. I'm like, I never saw hockey players working on edge and balance control. I said, you look like a figure skater. He said, Barbara, I want to be a better skater. I work with Laura Stam, who helped him with the skating. And he said, you know, I, I, maybe we could work one day. And I went, oh, sure, definitely. In the meantime, I'm saying to myself, but am I crazy? I don't know anything about hockey. So I did buy a pair of hockey skates and I practiced on them and I picked it up right away because I'm a speed skater as well. And I went in and started working with Bobby. And before I knew it, I had half the team with me working on skating. And Al Arbor, the late great Al Arbor, he would always walk by me and put his thumb up. Wow. I said, good job, Barbara. I want my team to skate better. We want to win the Stanley Cup. I said, okay, great. I'll do whatever I can. And I got along with all the players. There was never a problem. Um, I had one or two problems, you know, with, with skaters that didn't want to skate with me. Like Eddie Westfall would come in. He was much older. And he would see me on the ice and run out the back door. And <laughs> when I would see him, I'd laugh. He says, what do you think? I'm going to have a heart attack at my age. I'm not skating with you because my sessions, I might be 5'2", but my sessions are very hard. And it was <laughs> unbelievable being with the Islanders. I, I mean, I cannot tell you what. I'm still going off that, and that was 1977. Well, I'm sure you're not the only one going off that, Barbara, but you are you might be the only female uh, going off that and what an accomplishment that is I mean uh, who real so you mentioned Bob Nystrom and I mean holy I'm sitting here and when you're telling these stories and Al Arbor giving you the thumbs up and I mean listen I'm only 32 I'm almost 33 so I really you know I've only seen uh, my dad is a huge uh, hockey guy he's a scout he's, uh, he's we had every VHS 
I'm not kidding. When I say every hockey VHS there is, I swear to God, we had over 5,000 movies and about 1,000 of them were hockey. I'm not exaggerating at all. And people that know me can <laughs> can attest to this. So I'm telling you, that's the only that's the only way that I got to see these kind of things, right? I have all the legends of hockey and all that stuff. But what an incredible... The, the New York Islanders in the 80s, Barbara, and the first thing, like, what an incredible story, you know? Like, I was telling this, uh, you know, me and you connected, uh, we spoke a few weeks ago, and over Facebook, and I remember uh, the first person I told, I think it was my girlfriend, uh, and her dad, Steve, and he has just been floored. He's been on me. He's like, when's she coming on? When's she coming on? You gotta get her on. You gotta get her on, you know? Like, because... And I'm like, I know. And like, at first I was like, I, and I, it was a no brainer for me, Barbara. Like I, you know, you sent me them like, wow. Like, cause I, I'll be honest living out here. Uh, I didn't really know too much about, about you. And just cause I'm younger. And I think that's a shame. Like, how did I not know? How did I not know? Um, that this took place, you know what I mean? And yes, I've been kind of off the radar for the last 10 years and maybe most people do know. Um, but if people in hockey do not know that this took place, they need to know. Um, and you were, uh, actually inducted, uh, into the Suffolk sports hockey or no Suffolk sports hall of fame on Long Island right. in the category with the class of hockey, I believe, uh, in 2011, that, that's huge. Uh, that's must be really nice for them to recognize that. Uh, that was ob- nice. All my students went, all their parents, and I was very happy, that- but it's kind of a thorn in my side. Because when I was the first female coach in the NHL and the first woman to coach on a national level, a men's team, I always thought I would get into the Hall of Fame in Toronto. And I tried every year, and Al Arbor wrote a letter every year, but so did all of the Islanders. They all wrote letters. And for 25 years, they told me, we're not accepting women into the Hall of Fame. And then when they started accepting them, I'll tell you the truth, I thought I would be a shoe in but I still have not gotten in there, and it's a really sore spot with me. But before I leave this earth, I will get in there. That's for sure. Well, listen, Barbara, I'm going to do everything in my power. Not that I have a lot, but I, I've been talking to a lot of great hockey people. Uh, man, uh, this, to me, is a no-brainer. Um unbelievable like listen I could I I can already tell you how that went down and like the process of you trying to do 25 years and them shutting you down and that right there Barbara um, before they even allowed women into the Hall of Fame doesn't that like doesn't that right there like qualify you to get in to the Hall of Fame because they weren't even accepting women into the Hall of Fame but then you're coaching and winning the, the team's winning Stanley Cups it's never happened before um, shouldn't you really have been the first woman to get inducted yes. into the Hall of Fame? Yes, I really should have. I'm not a hockey player, but they had different categories and they had a building category. And I really believe I should be in the building category because many women became, I traveled all over the United States and I trained figure skaters to become power skating coaches. Yep. And there, there were hundreds of them, and to this day, teams have women, but you, they don't recognize them. They, they don't talk about them, and that's kind of upsetting that, you know, I broke the glass ceiling, and many women became skating coaches, but you just don't hear about them, and they are training NHL teams, which I'm happy to see, but they should acknowledge them more. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I know for a fact they're trading NHL teams. And I was going to tell you this earlier, but I was, sa- I, I'm, I'm just saving it and it works really well right now, Barbara. And this is a true story. So, uh, there's a really uh, prominent female skating coach, uh, where I'm from originally out in the Vancouver, Canada area. And her name is Barb too. Her name is Barb Adebaum. And she looks just like you. I swear to God, she's a little bit younger than you and everybody. I'm not kidding. I, I hope she's not listening and she's really nice, but you have to understand that guys probably thought this about you too just because your sessions were so hard okay so we called her and I, I hate to say this, and I was a kid, and I didn't make it up, but we called her Barb Ado bitch. Excuse my language, um, but but listen, she worked with Pavel Bure. She worked with all the Canucks, um, and you know what I mean? So this was, and I'm talking, this is in the 90s. So this is 20 years, 
um, you know, 15, 20 years after you had done it. So, right. and I mean, and so, I mean, obviously it's just funny that her name's Barb too, but I mean, she's an incredible skater and I'm telling you like guys, when a guy sees uh, a woman that can skate it, it, uh, I don't know, uh, but they, I guarantee you had most of, when they were there, you had their, their attention 100%, right? Yes, totally. <laughs> they have total respect for me and my knowledge, and they listen to me. And they also talk to me about their problems. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like a, a power skating psychiatrist here. <laughs> well, you know what? And I, you you really are and that's the thing about being a coach and um i could see that uh you know wow i never even thought of that and you know for your players that are lucky enough to work with you uh on a regular basis and build that relationship with you um they probably do feel a lot more comfortable talking to you one one because you're not in, one you're a female of course two right. you're two you're you're not really in the hockey world where you're gonna tell other scouts or whatever you're just more focused on their skating and let's get them better yeah. and let's make you a better person and let's make you whatever so for them to be able to open up to you about problems they don't have to worry about you going to tell the assistant coach or to tell the gm or to tell whatever so what an incredible no, experience and the players felt comfortable because like you just said, I was a woman. They could tell me their weaknesses. But they also told me if you were a guy, I would not be telling you my weaknesses. Exactly. So it's complimentary to have a woman with a men's team or a man with a girl's team. Yeah. Ironically, that works out better. Uh, I, I actually believe it too. And, um, there's, uh, I'll tell you what, like when I was, you know, I was at a bad point in my life uh, when this took place. I was actually in jail, um, but I was watching uh, the NHL skills competition um, a few years ago. And this is when they had the women uh, competing with the men. And there is a lady by the name of Kendall Coyne Schofield. Now, right. she's an American hockey player. I don't know where she's from. She's a beautiful blonde. Uh, but let me tell you what. When she, she was the very first skater in the fastest skater event in the NHL skills competition. They had right. never had girls in the competition before. They had never, they had, that was the very first event of the night. That was the very, so it was, she was the very first girl uh, to really, and it was a center stage, Barbara. Like we're talking national TV, sold yeah, out. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, sold out that. arena. I was really happy to see that. Holy shit! Excuse my language. Can that girl move? I couldn't yeah. believe it. I was. I had never been so excited since I was a kid to see somebody uh, in a skills. I was like cheering her on, and holy shit, could she move? That was, I'll tell you what, Barbara, that was, I, I, I hate to say this and you, you know, you might go against me and that's fine, but predominantly in sports, females are just built differently um, with their hips and the way they do. So they're not as powerful or they're not as strong or, or they don't skate the same or they don't run the same. Typically, I don't want to say, cause I know it's not always the case, but right. I'll tell you what, man, this girl, she's a, she could skate at the NHL level. She looked like, a, like I couldn't believe it. And so it was at that moment, Barbara, that I was like, wow, you know what? Like, cause I was shutting down women's hockey in my mind. I'm like, eh, they're not. And it changed. That changed my whole mindset. I was like, wow, you know, what have I been thinking these years? Like you should be supporting them. You should be, you know, like, let's get out there. You know, like, yeah, she, she helped a lot of girls winning that. A lot of young girls that I talked to said, I want to be just like her. I said, that's so good, but you got to practice your skating. Because hockey is a skating sport, and the better skater you are, the better you know game you'll have. Uh. But I'll tell you, in 1977, when I went into Rack and the Rink and saw hundreds of cars in the parking lot, I'm like, what the heck's going on? I, I just figured they made a big trade. So I went around the back of the rink and put my skates on, and I was waiting for a few of the players, and all of a sudden the doors opened, and I had like a hundred people running at me, taking my picture, trying to talk to me all at once. I'm like, I didn't know what was going on, and then Al Arbor skated up to me and said, Barbara, we have 
big news for you. And I said, yeah, what's that? And he said, Barbara, we just named you the first female coach in the National Hockey League. And you know what? I could not believe, being a woman, that the Islanders would recognize me to do that for me. And then before I knew it, I was on Channel 2, 4, 7, Canadian TV, every newspaper, every magazine. I was just in a whirlwind of of traveling and doing all these things. I got to write my first book, More Power to Your Skating. I traveled on, on book reviews all over the United States. It was the most amazing time for me. And then to see my student, Bobby Nystrom, win, win the, the winning goal for the first Islanders in 1980, the Stanley Cup. I cannot tell you, I relive those moments in my head so much. I just talked to Bobby like two weeks ago. I, I keep in touch with him. A lot of the Rangers and Islanders gave me um, a crystal, an award, it's beautiful, for wow. my Lifetime Achievement Award with, with my work with children. Wow. And it was wonderful. I even got to sit with Messier and I can't stand the Rangers. <laughs> but, you know, it was just, I've had so many... Uh, accomplishments in my life and they stay with me but I skate every day still and uh, Sonny Milano he was traded he's with uh, the Los Angeles team yeah he was my student and I worked with Keith and Kate and Eric Birdorf is with the Ottawa Senators and my Robert Master Simone who just got picked up by Detroit and he got a full scholarship to DU wow I mean, getting a full scholarship to me is even better than being in the NHL. Uh, you know what? I tend to agree with you on that one, and I wouldn't have agreed with you when I was 20 years old. And Barbara, I'm going to just quickly uh, interject here. Uh, I talk about it uh, on the podcast. I've had some guys. Uh, so we're up here in Canada. Uh, when we play junior, we play major junior, OHL, Quebec major junior, Western Hockey League, like that type of thing. And uh, basically, if you play in that league... Excuse me, I have allergies, but uh, if you play in that league, uh, as soon as you play one game, Barbara, you forfeit your scholarship eligibility because you turn professional. So if you sign right. a con so if you sign a contract at fifteen, sixteen to play major junior up here in Canada, you're no longer eligible to get a scholarship, um, and you're only making and you only make like eighty five bucks every two weeks as a sixteen year old. It's not like you're making a lot of money. I'm talking like peanuts here, okay? And so basically, what they do is they say, okay, so you forfeit your scholarship eligibility, but every year you play in our league, the team that you play for, or for whatever year that is, they have to pay for a year post-secondary education in any uh, a Canadian institute, like university, and if you're American, down in the States. And now, actually, because of this, Canada's uh, university hockey program has become much better in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, 20 years maybe, but um, at the same time, uh, so you, you can get a scholarship in the States, but yes, you are working towards this scholarship money in Canada. But then if you sign a pro contract, either NHL right. or AHL, you forfeit all of that schooling. But then if you go to the ECHL, you have till like January 10th, you get to play half the year and then you have to make up your mind. Are you going to stay pro or are you going to go to school? And I think that's BS. So I am, you know, yeah, I agree. So I think. Uh, you know, you know, I loved my time in the Western Hockey League, but listen, to make it to the NHL, to stay in the NHL, to make a living playing hockey uh, for any period of time is pr is very unlikely. Uh, and the chances of having to fall back on something else and, and find something else is 100 percent, whether it's at 20 years old, 30 years old or 40 years old, you can't play hockey forever. So. You know, that's great to hear. I'm, I'm sure, like, you know, you're, I can sense that, like, yes, you, I'm sure you love the game of hockey. It's kind of evolved into your life and the players. Um, but I could see that your relationship with the players in hockey is, is more personal. And like you said, you, you focus on your yes. skating. The last I really believe in education, totally. Well, I do. And the younger, the players are getting younger and younger, but their careers are also over earlier than it used to be. Yeah. Players used to play until late 30s, even early 40s. Now these kids are down, they're back down in the AHL in their early 20s. 
you must have a backup with your wife. Yeah. And it's got to be school. But you know what? If you're not college-oriented, we have a BOCES on Long Island where players can learn a trade. You know, um, my friend went, I couldn't believe it. He was a goalie, and he went for uh, BOCES to learn hair coloring. Okay. For women's hair. And I went, are you kidding? <laughs> and then I saw him a few years later. He said, Barbara, I own four beauty parlors, and I'm making a fortune. <laughs> and I laughed because I, I, I couldn't see him learning to color hair and to do hair. He said, I was smart. I said, you really were. No doubt. And another player went to a bow season. He studied, you know, cars and transmissions. Well, he owns three places. So, you know, some people aren't cut out for college, but the BOCES is important. But when you're young and you think, oh, I'm going to get into the NHL like every one of my hundred students a week think, I want them to always think positive, but reality-wise, very few will make it into the NHL. I, I got lucky with some of the kids on Long Island that got into the and see Ruggiero, I trained him too. Yeah. He was down the block. He signed with Anaheim. Yeah. And he's he's with the ECHL. I, I trained him for years. But college is very important and having a backup plan at the college is more important. Especially if you have a family. Yeah, absolutely. But you know what? Uh, with drugs and alcohol I traveled ten years with athletes helping athletes. We went to the colleges and high schools and talked to the kids about not staying away from drugs and alcohol. And I also lectured, I'm a motivational speaker, I lectured in the jails in Nassau County. That was a little frightening at first. <laughs> but um, I, I come from an alcoholic family. My mother was an alcoholic. So I know the setbacks, you know, with, with that. And that's why I kept very busy. I skated every day of my life. And I still am. God has really given me a gift. But people out there that have a drug alcohol problem, you know what? Buy yourself a good pair of sneakers. And when you want to get drunk or get high, get out and run five miles. And you will feel better emotionally and mentally. I can tell you that. But it happens in, I had a figure skating coach, beautiful, 23 years old. I mean, her boyfriend just got out of jail and he did heroin. So she tried it with him and she died. Wow. Because she had asthma and the heroin closed her throat. She was only 23. And to see her die, one time, just one time. And I've gone to many funerals with athletes because people think athletes don't have problems, but they do. And the parents that are listening to me don't wear blinders. Take the blinders off. If you think your son or daughter is into drugs, get them into a rehab, get them into NA every night, AA, do something, but don't wait. Because the ending could be very fatal. Parents uh, like to wear blinders, like not my son, not my daughter. But if you think it, then get help now before it's too late. I, I yeah, I say it all the time too. I, I just uh, lost another friend a couple weeks ago, Sean, and uh, he was featured on the news um, because. They're saying because of the COVID-19, the the lack of policing there for a while, I guess the drug supply is deadlier, but also um, people weren't working. Um, there were no meetings. There are no nothing. And people were sitting at home uh, in, you know, suffering in silence. And a lot of these people relapsed. He was actually clean for, for 90 days. It just got out of rehab, was going to NA meetings and and basically all of a sudden that all stopped and uh, you know oh, his his, yeah, his his work stopped his everything and and uh, unfortunately he picked up and uh, his mom wasn't picking wasn't answering the phone for a couple of days and his mom his, his mom Joanne found him 
uh, in his basement in his house. So uh, a couple of days later, and uh, you know, rest in peace, Sean. We're gonna miss you. And it's just it, that's the thing. Uh, if you're listening, if you're struggling with drugs or alcohol, or mental health or suicidal thoughts, anything, uh, reach out and get help. And that is really yes, reach out. That is really why uh, you know I wanted to start this uh, the Puck Support Foundation. It's not just me. Like it's not. I want to keep saying this. It's not about me. It's not the Brady Level Foundation. This is the Puck Support Foundation. I am just one small piece of a very big puzzle um, that is just helping to bring it all together. Um, because people really have no idea the amount of messages I'm getting every single day uh, from ex players uh, for or from their families. Uh, guys I played with or against uh, that have either gone through some sort of alcohol addiction, drug addiction, uh, post-concussion syndrome, or mental health, uh, really struggling. Um, I'm not kidding. In the last two months, I've had over 50, probably 50 to 75 messages about different hockey players uh, from the junior to professional levels that are all struggling, uh, mostly after they're done playing. But a few have reached out. Uh, actually, one of them is in rehab right now. I'm ne- I'll never say his name, of course, uh, but I speak to him every single day. And if you're listening, buddy, uh, hang in there. Uh, you're doing well. Uh, you're going to get through this, and we're going to do some awesome things together, man. Just stay strong. Uh, but, yeah, like if you guys are st- anyone struggling out there, please get help. Uh, Barbara, you, you go around and you, you speak to schools and jails, like you said. Uh, yes. What was that experience like for you the first time? Because I'm getting into that. Uh, I've done some public speaking. I'm not nervous. I'm not shy. That doesn't bug me too much. Um, but what was that experience like, and what kind of advice do you have for me moving forward uh, initially when I get started doing this sort of thing? Well, you have a background, but when I traveled with athletes helping athletes, they were the Flyers and the Rangers and the Islanders, and I'll never forget, we went to a high school in New Jersey. And we were all talking, don't do, they were all talking, don't do drugs, don't drink. And one kid stood up and I knew, oh God, what is this kid going to say? And he said, I have something to say. You're all a bunch of hypocrites. And we all looked at each other and we didn't know what to say. And he said, all of you, do you, do you come from a drug alcohol family? Tell me now, raise your hand. And all of a sudden I stood up. And I'm like, I come from an alcoholic family. I had many ice shows that I took a taxi to because no one came to my ice shows. Or I was waiting in a dark parking lot all night for my mother to pick me up, but my mother was drinking. And I said, I lived it. I lived the horror that you lived. And he, and he just stood there. And I couldn't believe that I was actually standing up, announcing this to the world that... I come from an alcoholic family, and that's why I skated every day. My two brothers were not so lucky. One of them passed away four years ago, um, cirrhosis of the liver from drinking. Sorry and my nice. other brother right now is in a rehab in Florida. I must have paid for eight rehabs, but when do you learn? You have to take care of yourself and take care of your life. And that, that boy that stood up, he waited till it was over when he came up to me. And he said, thank you so much for standing up. And, and you really helped me because you, you reached out to me. But now with this virus, reach out to somebody. Even one person, get a sponsor that you can just talk to and say, I want to do drugs. I want to get drunk tonight. You got to reach out to somebody. Even though, you know, a lot of the places are closed because of the virus. I, I lost nine, nine friends. Wow. And they were all in, believe it or not, they were all athletic. The virus is dangerous. You have to be careful. But that, that boy stayed in my mind. And then I wasn't afraid. I went to high schools and colleges and talked about drugs and alcohol. I went with Jiggs McDonald's and we talked about and. And I lived it, so I know what the kids were living through. You know, I could adapt to what they were feeling. So my motivation of speaking, I always tend to go that way to try to help kids. But I believe in the power of positive thinking. The book that Norman Vincent Peale wrote, I read it a thousand times. And now they have the CD out. 
and I play the CD in my car, and I read that book constantly because I put my mind to something, and I do it. I accomplish it because I, I believe in myself. That took a long time to do that, you know? But if you go on my website and you see my hockey brochure, it says right in it, I talk about bullying, uh, positive thinking, self-esteem issues, and drug and alcohol issues. And it says it right on my um, the flyer that I have on my website. Because that's more important to me than even the skating. Because after lunch, the kids sit with me an hour a day and I talk to them about drugs and alcohol and what it can do. And uh, that's, God has left me on this earth because of my career. I get to work with thousands of kids, but I always talk about, I talk about God and I talk about drugs and alcohol. And that's why I'm on this earth. My, my son passed away four years ago from bilateral pneumonia. And I pleaded with God, take me. Don't take my son, please. But God had other plans. And I have great faith. I have very strong faith. And I know why I'm on this earth, to touch children's lives and to form them into thinking positively and good about themselves. So all of those things are very important to me. Of course, I, I train great skaters that get in the NHL and the AHL. But again, I'd rather see them get that college scholarship. Yeah, I like we talked about it. It's really um, going to give you a lot more value later in life. And I wish I, some something in, about that whole situation makes me wish that I would have went the college route. But I can't again. You can't go would have, should have, could have. Um, oh yeah, I believe. I always say that. Woulda, shoulda, coulda. That's yeah. funny you say that. Yeah. But you know, the power of the positive thinking is something that I truly believe in. I'm gonna actually look into that book. Uh, I'm big. Oh, I love it. I, I love it. I'm big on the secret, the law of attraction. I mean, I wish I practiced it more, uh, but now. Actually, uh, uh, sorry. Like you know, when you set your mind to something, when you keep saying, when you set a goal, uh, and you keep you know seeing the picture of it or, or hearing it, or, and you keep just reinforcing that, um, yes. things do happen. Like incredible things, um, and that's very much the way that I feel right now with everything that's going on in in my life with the podcast, with this foundation, with the book I'm writing, um, just with everything that's going on. Well, you're helping so many people, and they're listening to you. Well, uh, you know, and that's the thing is, you know, I went through hell for the last, uh, whatever, 12 years, well, even longer, really, because I was suffering in silence about some of the sexual abuse that happened to me as a kid and just whatever. But at the same time, a lot of people go through worse things. Uh, but Barbara, I'm telling you, like, I was at the point where I really didn't give a two craps about... Um, you know, I thought that I was never going to get out of it. I thought I was going to be in jail, in and out of jail for the rest of my life. I thought I was going to be using drugs for the rest of my life. There was no point. I could never stop. Um, there's nothing else out there for me. Nobody will, uh, nobody will support me. Nobody will talk to me again. Cause I've, you know, just lied and stole and cheated and done every I know, low but life. When you think that way, that's the kind yes. of life that you'll have. Yes. A hundred percent got to think positive about your life. Do something with your life. And you're doing it. You're doing a great job. God wants you to have this podcast and talk to people to save their lives. And, and I truly believe that. There's no, there's no other reason why I have not died with the amount of drugs I used to do, with the type of drugs I used to do, and uh, with the amount of times I have overdosed uh, and almost died. Um, and that is where I'm at now with realizing how fortunate, how lucky I am. Uh, and maybe, uh, not maybe, it's not even maybe, Barbara, you know, I, I read uh, on the last two podcasts, a couple journal entries from jail, just at the end, because I was writing a lot. And I talk about how I found God in jail too. And everybody has a different understanding of God. And I don't try to push any one belief on anybody. My belief is my belief. Uh, yes, right. I'm, Chris I'm Christian, but I'm not going to try to push it on nobody. Um, but uh, you know, it's just kind of interesting. You know, I obviously was at the time where I knew I needed to find myself going a different direction. I really had no idea what it was going to look like. Uh, even when I got out, I didn't know what it was going to look like. And I fell back into my old life for a short period of time. 
Right. Uh, but I'll tell you, I've said it before, if people listen, I put my skates on again after five years and skated on the frozen like 30 seconds from my driveway. Uh, I could have done it way all winter. I'm, I waited till almost the ice was get melted like a week after I went skating for the first time and it was there for like four months. Um, but I put my skates on and I wheeled around on the ice and you know, the next day I skated again. And then that night I recorded the first podcast out of the blue in my girlfriend's mom's car for no reason. I had no plan of making a podcast. I had no, had not talked to anybody. I had not, you know, I had no interviews yeah, set up. It was meant to be. It was meant to be. Yeah. And so I feel like I went through hell uh, for that period of time so that I can come up with it and help people. Even if it's just one person, uh, then it will all be worth it. But Barbara, you really have been uh, such a pioneer. I said it earlier, that word, but I am really, really, really going to advocate for you uh, to get in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And I don't even, the, the thing is, is like people shouldn't even have to advocate for you. They should be coming to you. And I truly feel that way. And if anybody listening, um, you know, I'm sure, like, I, I, I just don't see anybody can argue against it. Uh, there's really no, it, what is the argument against Barbara Williams not being in the Hockey Hall of Fame? Somebody please tell me. If you can find one, let's, let's uh, bring it up, send it to me. And uh, we can discuss it, but I'm sure I'll be waiting till I die because that's never going to happen. Um, so, you know, I'm truly, uh, like I said, I don't have a whole lot of power, but I'm going to just, you know, I'll keep bringing it up. Uh, so maybe the I right, appreciate that. so maybe the right, and the right person hears I, it. I have a movie coming out in a year or a year and a half. It probably will be called Cold as Ice. It would be my life story. Awesome. Which was very upsetting, even to write it with the producers in Hollywood. But it will be in a year or a year and a half when you see my life and how I wound up in the National Hockey League is amazing. So that that movie I, I am waiting for. I have written four books. Um, I wrote, of course, three, three children's books, you know, ice hockey, but I wrote Mags 52, The Ghost of New York, don't ask me how I wrote this book, but it's a DE agent, and it's an unbelievable script. You could get it on the Amazon, I think, for four dollars. But next month, I turned it into a book. But amazing about drugs and alcohol and and people's lives and it, and a great ending. It, it will be a great movie one day. And my girlfriend said, "Where the heck did that come from?" <laughs> I said, I have no idea. I, I told my priest, I think a ghost wrote it through me. And he laughed. He said, Barbara, you're skating too much. <laughs> but Mag's 52. I great will. book I wrote with my two friends. Yeah. And the other books, A Christmas Tale with the Brooklyn Rink Rats. I was born in Brooklyn, but I was raised in Manhasset, which is an affluent community. And I got to take lessons every day because my father could afford it. But my other two books, Positive Power, I wrote four years ago. That's a, a hockey book. And More Power to You Skating, I wrote when I was with the Islanders. And you also I, are writing a, a book, She Shoots, She Scores, a national publication for uh, famous women in hockey. Is well, that correct? Yeah, I was in that. Okay. I was in that book. They devoted a page for me, She Shoots, She Scores. Okay. And I did the, the NHL Network last month. It was funny having two women interview me. Yeah, Tara so Sloan. So men interviewing me. Yeah. So that was nice, you it, know, for a change. Yeah, I, I actually watched that last night uh, for the second or third time, and I, and I know you said that on there. It's like you mentioned it, and I was like, oh, well, I'm not a woman. Maybe I should get my girlfriend out. No, I'm just kidding, right? But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I was sitting here thinking about it, Barbara, and really the, the only real reason why I could see why you're not in the Hockey Hall of Fame and why people don't know about it is because it was 1977 and there was no social media. <laughs> like... That's no, it. for 25 years, they would, they would just say to me, we don't accept women in, into our esteemed establishment, and they would hang up on me. Wow. And then when they did accept women, I, I told Al, I'm going to be a shoo-in now. And, and I wasn't in. But, you know, there are a lot of Canadians on that board. Yeah. I'm not saying they were anti-USA for me, but I deserved in my heart to be, a, to be in there. Absolutely. 100%, Barbara. Not even just, like you said, 
Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the more background story because, yes, you were the first female coach in the NHL. But, Barbara, after that, you actually went around, like you said, across the states and started teaching women figure skaters to teach power skating and yes. and that so that to me right there uh is more than working with the islanders like you went and touched the entire country or maybe not the entire country but a good portion of the country and you really almost uh invented or reinvented uh the power, power skating. skating yes but even to this day I, I train I train right now with uh, six girls on Long Island. And I trained 10 last year to become skating coaches. They work with me. They watch me. They observe me. They listen to what I say to the players. And they thank me every day. They have great careers. Yeah, see, this is just... I'm shaking my head and, uh, yeah, I just think that with... uh, yeah, with everything, like, I just, it is a no-brainer. Who the hell can argue against that? Like, what the hell is going on? If anything, the thing is, Barbara... And, you know, I went to get a new pair of skates because I, I needed a new pair of skates. I went to CCM, the store near me, and they actually would not give me a pair of skates. I went, are you kidding? I trained thousands of kids. I'm on the National Hockey League Network. You're not going to give me a pair of CCM skates? Why? I couldn't believe that. I mean, I have never bought my own skates because I'm a National Hockey League coach. Yeah. But CCM, the guy said, "Uh, no, we can't. You you have to buy them. I went, no way am I buying a pair of skates. I still can't believe, uh, I forgot his name, Richard Blackshaw, who owns CCM. I hope he's listening because he lives in Canada. Well, I have a friend that works for CCM, so he's a rep for them. So maybe I'll uh, shoot him a message. Yeah, t- but, tell them. But I, I have hockey schools all summer, and people look at my skates. And when I do the movie, when we shoot it, they won't be wearing CCM skates, that's for sure. Well, Barbara, listen, I don't know if you've ever heard of Verbero Hockey, but this is Andy Sutton's new company. I'm going to send you the link. These are a brand, it's a, it's a, the company's been around for a decade, but Andy Sutton, former NHL, he was a, a guest on my show, episode 19. Um, but he, uh, you know, he played in the NHL for 13 years and now he's invested this money, uh, into Verbero hockey and they call it the Bugatti of hockey. I'm going to order a pair of their skates. Like they these skates are apparently unbelievable. Like so much science and technology has gone into it. So I'm kind of curious, maybe I should, uh, talk to him and, uh, message him and see if I can't help you out with that. Because I mean, if you need skates and like you said, if you're going to be doing the video, like he's trying to get the brand out there and I'm telling you right now, they're, they're, they're equipment is unbelievable so i'm gonna i'm gonna actually shoot him a text uh maybe put yeah, you in contact him with him definitely uh te- you know text me for sure i will barbara i know you have uh, a busy day i know it was a hard day for you yesterday you mentioned that your son passed away yesterday was a four-year anniversary i'm so sorry for your loss um yeah. you know stay strong barbara you are really helping so many people you've helped so many people please continue doing what you're doing i know you don't need me to tell you that um but stay safe uh, I am really, really, really going to advocate for you. It may not be me, but I'm going to keep mentioning it to people. And uh, I know, like, you know, somebody is going to really help you get in there because it's just, fuck, like, real real shit. They should be coming in and knock on your door and be like, hey, Barbara, I'm sorry. Here you go. Because it just isn't right. Yeah, in the, my mind. the builder category, I see myself in because of helping millions of kids. Absolutely. All over much. the United States and Europe. I should definitely be in that building category. And that would really help me because, you know, one of these days I will hang up my skates, but not now. I, I train 100 kids a week and I have hockey schools all summer with hundreds of kids. But I like the motivational speaking. I like doing that. And I'm an animal activist. When I hang up the phone, I have to go feed 20 cats. Wow. They, they sit there waiting for me. But somebody's got to feed them and get them neutered and give them homes That's because they're feral. And I hope the people out there will be kind to animals, the birds, the squirrels, the feral cats. Give them something to eat. That's you know? right. That's right. We uh, actually, Taylor, my girlfriend, actually went and rescued a couple baby robins. Uh, her aunt actually found them. And 
Uh, she was able uh, to rehome them. One of them did, unfortunately didn't make it. Like they were, they were like literally a day old, um, but they were able to save the one. So that's really great. Uh, I'm a huge animal guy. I got my little puppy. She's my, she's my girl. Um, but I do. Before I let you go, uh, I have a couple questions just from the listeners, if you don't mind. Um, okay. Uh, David Carlson, uh, who is just uh, a great sense of support for me. I don't know him personally, just uh, speak to him on Facebook. He's always uh, listening and uh, supporting me. He's got a couple questions for you. He says, um, since I own a skate shop, I would be very interested to know what blade hollow Barb uses. I always recommend a shallower hollow. That's what I skate on too. He says, I always recommend a shallower hollow. I skate on 7 eighths hollow, but everyone has personal preferences. Thank you, Barbara and Brady. So uh, before we talk about this, she said 5 eighths. I skate on 5 eighths as well. Um, right. David Carlson owns Sniper Skate Sharpening and Profiling. Uh, that's in Spruce Grove, Alberta. So if you're listening, Spruce Grove, Edmonton area, uh, guys, support him. Uh, once you guys uh, need your skate sharpened, getting back on the ice, when things start opening up again, uh, you can visit his uh, Facebook page, facebook.com slash Sniper Skate Shop. Uh, so yeah, Barbara 5.8, uh, guys, the uh, hollow. And I have that in my book, Positive Power. I talk about the profiling. Okay. All my travel players get the profiling done, which is very good. And and it lasts longer, the sharpening. Yeah. And all my rec league kids, they just get their skate sharpened every three or four times. Yeah. Have you ever heard of this uh, V sharpening? Or I, I don't know what it's called. It's like this new form of sharpening that... Uh, but it's incredible. I've only skated on it once, and as soon as you step on the ice, you just instantly glide. It's really wild. Uh, I'll send you a link to it. Maybe you could check it out. I, I was curious as to see yeah, what you thought of that. Yeah, but as soon as I get on the ice, I, I glide right away. Oh, I believe it. You you are... Thank God. God gave me this gift. I could fly down the ice. <laughs> well, I no, I, I've i seen videos of you skating, Barbara. I wish I would have got to work with you, but I'll be honest. Now, I wish I would have got to work with you. I, I probably would have shied away from it because I didn't know what it took as a kid. I didn't, you know what I mean? I just wanted to have fun and um, play and stick handle and whatever else. So I wish that yeah, I you got to work on your skating. It's a skating sport. Yeah, I mean, I was lucky that I. The better skater, the better t you know, the better game you'll have. That's right. I'd... And if you can, if you can't afford anything, go to a figure skating coach and just put everything that she's teaching you in a hockey stance. Yeah. And that will help. Figure skating is so, uh, for edge control, uh, Jeff Skinner is yes. uh, one of the best skaters in the National Hockey League. He did figure skating. Uh, David Carlson wanted to know if he was one of your students. I don't think he was, but um, next question again, David Carlson. Uh, he just wants to know who, in your opinion, during your incredible career is the best skater, i.e. use of edges, efficiency, and powerful strides uh, that you have either seen or taught personally? Well, I watched... Uh I believe it's Connor McDavid with the oil lift. Oh, Connor McDavid, yeah. Connor McDavid and Dylan Larkin with mm. Detroit. Both very good skaters. Yeah, they are. They are probably two of the best skaters. Um, yes, very and, good. I watch, I watch them the little I do watch on games because I teach it every day. When I come home, I don't want to watch a hockey game. But I have seen them skate. I was very impressed with their skating. There's uh, Dylan Larkin, I believe, set the record for fastest skater in the skills competition. Then Connor McDavid broke it. Uh, and then uh, a, a kid I used to coach, uh, the best player on the New York Islanders, Matthew Barzell from my hometown. He, oh, yes. He, he won the he, fastest he, skater last year. And he's a great skater. Fast, unbelievable. Uh, I told talk like about. like a mouse and a rat. He just, he just goes down the ice. Yeah, he's, he's wild. Yeah. And. I skated with Agility him. Agility and timing is excellent. I skated with him when I was th when he was thirteen and I was twenty four. Wow. I shared this story and I was uh, just got out of rehab and I was working with a, a, a power skating coach and my trainer on the ice, just me and the three, uh, the, those two. And uh, I was waiting for the Zamboni to get off and uh, like just before and like there's kids out there. It was like two o'clock in the afternoon. These kids should have been in school. There's only like two of them out there. It's at this private hockey club. And I was watching them and this kid's buzzing around. I'm like, holy shit, this kid's good. Like, wow. So I went over and I was yeah, like, hey, yeah, I, I like him. I went, I went over to his dad, Mike. I didn't know him at the time. I'm like, hey, is that your son? He's like, 
down, like, will he stay out and skate with me? And he did. And he was just as good as me at 13 and I was 24. And I mean, I was playing in the HL or just had come out of the HL at the time. So like, he, he's just, he won the Calder Rookie of the Year. Unbelievable. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, and then also I just have one comment from Jimmy Flores. Uh, he says, gorgeous, gorgeous woman. That's what he likes to say. So, <laughs> um, make sure you put my recent picture up with my black jacket on. I will definitely do that, Barbara. I'm gonna post all the links to your books, to your website, um, guys. Uh, I want to say thank you to Barbara Williams for joining me. Barbara, please uh, keep doing what you're doing uh, anytime you want to be on the show. Uh, hopefully, we get you into the Hockey Hall of Fame and then we can talk all about that. Um, yeah, let's... That, that would make me so happy. Well, I'm, uh, like I said, uh, I'm definitely on your team and uh, let's make this happen for you. Uh, guys, uh, you can uh, check out uh, her website, Barbara, if you want to send them over to your website. If there's anything you want to say or talk about your books, go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, www.dwilliamspowerskating.com. My, my brochure for my hockey school is on it with the pictures of some of the players that I've trained. And uh, I don't believe a lot of Canadians will be coming down, but my schools are filled with the kids from Long Island. And when my movie gets close to coming out, we're going to show it to Michael Jordan, who's involved with the Washington Capitals now. Um, show him September 1st about my movie. He might pick it up. Wow. But when it is going to be out, I'll let you know. Oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll be uh, one of the first ones to uh, watch it and support it and post it and uh, whatever you need from me, Barbara. Uh, I'm so glad we were able to do this uh, and now I can consider you a friend. Uh, I may be uh, texting you, calling you from time to time as I get going doing these speaking That's engagements. That's fine. And uh, Meg 52, The Ghost of New York that I wrote, a very good book for people to read adults only not kids <laughs> yeah this is an adults only show anyway so that's okay barbara but that's uh what a great uh, conversation thank you so much barbara i know you gotta get going to feed those uh hungry cats <laughs> um yeah they're waiting for me <laughs> okay barbara well you have a great day thank you so much for uh taking the time it to was do great this. speaking with you okay thanks barbara all right god bless god bless you too barbara bye now okay bye bye that's Barbara Williams. Guys, wow. That was amazing. Uh, very, very lucky to have her join the Hockey to Heroin, the Road to Recovery family, the first female to have on the show. She definitely won't be the last. Um, this is just such an incredible experience, you guys. I am so lucky. Thank you for listening. Um, wow, we have some big guests coming up. Doug Gilmore, Darren McCarty, Terry Ryan, Steve Seftel, uh, Ryan Vandenbush, guys, just amazing. Matthew Barnaby's going to be coming on uh, here in a couple weeks. Of course, he's an uh, NHL legend. Uh, we're going to be doing a couple other episodes. I'm going to be having my friend Carson Grant come on. Uh, he's going to speak a little bit about his experience uh, and troubles uh, playing hockey uh, out in Maple Ridge, the Minor Hockey Association, trying to make his way into juniors. Uh, and then also, um, unfortunately, he lost his brother uh, to a drug addiction a few years ago. So we're going to talk to him about that. Um, possibly on the same episode, we'll have Aaron Miller on um, to... Uh, talk about her her brother too lost his battle with addiction a hockey player and uh, she has the Miller Strong Foundation really excited guys uh, tomorrow Matt Thompson's coming up uh, this guy's awesome uh, really uh, has become a great friend to me uh, we talk multiple times throughout the day uh, really looking forward to hanging out on it with him getting on the ATVs taking him showing him the trails uh, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of friends up here, so it's just me with Taylor and the kids, which is great, but it's going to be nice to uh, meet him uh, and get this studio built in Matthew Lashinsky's honor. Uh, guys, please go to HockeyToHeroin.com if you want to win some free team-issued gear every Sunday night. A live draw, Taylor and I will be on uh, the Hockey to Heroin, the Road to Recovery Facebook page. 
uh, doing live draws. If you want to sign up, hockeytoheroin.com, main page, uh, fill out the form, the team issued form, uh, and then uh, join us 9 p.m. Eastern Sunday nights. Times may be subject to change a little later because we do have kids and things do happen, um, but we're going to try to be there for nine. Um, guys, other than that, um, I mean, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I'm not going to read uh, the journal entry. I hope you guys are enjoying it. I haven't heard a lot of response, uh, so that's why I'm going to stop doing it. Um, possibly do it uh, once every four episodes or try to work out a schedule if you guys are enjoying it. Uh, but I haven't got any feedback on it quite yet. So uh, for now, I'm just going to put it on pause. Um, but also too, uh, there is a new feature on the website, on the homepage. Uh, please scroll all the way to the bottom and leave me a voice message. I'm going to play these voice messages back on the podcast. Uh, maybe you have a question for me. Maybe you have a request for a guest. Uh, maybe you have some positive inspiration and inspirational words for me uh, or some constructive, hopefully, criticism. Because uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, I love the Facebook comments, the Instagram comments. Find me on there at Hockey to Heroin. Follow me, of course. Uh, support the Puck Support at Puck Support on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, guys, thank you once again so, so much. I'm really looking forward to talking to Darren McCarty this week. I believe that's going to be the next episode, him or Doug Gilmore. Um, but guys, just remember, if you're struggling out, struggling out there, please reach out, ask for help. If not to me, to somebody else. Uh, it's a very dangerous world with drugs and alcohol, guys, and uh, I've been to enough funerals. So, guys... Let's just uh, work together, stick together, and remember, have a great day if you so choose.